Okay. Okay. Um, today we also have a guest speaker. Uh, it's the Professor Rubin Zeman, who is uh, well known for his works, for his, uh, with, with his uh, scientific work and also practical work in the field of intercultural communication. He is going to join us in half an hour from now. Until uh, that moment, I'm going to talk about uh, several elements, uh, about uh, several things which are uh, uh, included in this third, of, uh, third week of, uh, of the course in intercultural communication. And mainly, it, uh, these elements refer to uh, barriers in intercultural communications, uh, identity in the intercultural communication, how is identity seen and how it is related to uh, the field of intercultural communications. We talk about some problems, some barriers that uh, occur as a result of that. And then we proceed with the discussion that we are going to have with the Professor Rubin Zeman about the necessity of intercultural communication in today's context and the skills and education that is needed uh, in relation to uh, strengthening of the intercultural communication skills. Uh, as we already know, intercultural communications are a necessity today because these skills enable us uh, to adjust to our closest surrounding, but also to uh, to be global citizens and to be able to be able to do our work in a general context. Um, uh, this is a this is a quote that I often use when I talk about uh, uh, intercultural communication. That isolated cultures stag stagnate, while cultures that communicate among each other achieve achieve progress. So now we go to the issue uh, of identity uh, and intercultural communications. Uh, we all know that identity is about who we are and who others think we are. How do we come to understand who we, are, who we are and how do we communicate our identity to the others? There are different theories about this issue and uh, the theory that I uh, decided to select here is that of impression management and it's uh, given by Goffman who says that uh, this is how people present themselves and how they guide their in the impression others form, form of them. What is the identity? It's the relationship between the I and the other. There is no identity with the other. This clearly says that we cannot talk about the identity as an isolated thing, as an isolated issue. It is always related to the others around us. We also have to consider, as it is said in the third uh, statement here, we also have to consider the foreign identity or maybe the identity of, of, the, of the others. There are three perspectives on identity and communication. The social, social science perspective, which says that identity is created by self, by relating to groups. We relate to different kinds of groups that we decide to belong to. Then we have the other perspective, which is interpretive perspective, that identity is formed through communication with the others. Something happens as a result of the communication that we have with different parties, with different groups, with different uh, individuals. And what happens in this process that we often, we can often uh, change our habits, we can change our perspectives of seeing things. Maybe we start with one thing, but then we modify it through the process of communication. And then we have the third perspective, which is called so-called critical perspective. Identity is shaped through social and historical forces, something that refers to the fact that as the time goes by, uh, there are changes and uh, history um, marks different changes that can happen to the identity formation. Uh, uh, two kinds of identity. Uh, we have the personal identity based on the culture in which we are, we were socialized and we are still socialized and the cultural identity founded on the sense of belonging to a community with certain characteristics. Uh, 
That was just a brief overview. Uh, you have lots of details about the, the identity formation in the, in the materials which are attached uh, for the third week of the course. What I thought would be useful to uh, uh, mention during this uh, discussion today is uh, the identity development issue. Uh, people can identify with a multitude of groups, gender, age, religion, nationality. These are just a, a selection of, uh, of uh, a couple of groups. Our identities develop over a period of time and always through the interaction with others. Um, in the theory, there are also different types of models that describe how minority and majority identity, identities develop. Although some models center on racial and ethnic identities, they may also apply to other identities such as class, gender, or sex sexual orientation. Uh, so let's start with the uh, way the minority identity is, is developed. Uh, in general, minority identity tends to develop earlier than majority identities. For example, straight people tend to not think about their sexual orientation identity often, whereas gay people are often acutely aware of their sex sexual orientation identity being different from the majority and develop a sense of sexual ori orientation identity earlier than people who are straight. Similarly to this, while whites may develop a strong ethnic identity, they often do not think about their racial identity, whereas members of racial minorities are aware of their racial identities at an early age. There are several stages in the minority identity development. Stage one, it's the unexamined identity. It's, the, it's um, uh, characterized by the lack of exploration of identity, regardless if it's uh, racial, no, uh, racial, ethnic, sexual orientation, etc. At this stage, individuals simply lack interest in the identity issue. Uh, minority group members may uh, initially accept the values and attitudes of the majority culture, expressing positive atti attitudes towards the dominant group and negative views of their own group. Uh, you have a couple of examples here, but uh, in the interest of the time, I would, I would proceed because there are several things that I wanted to share with you today. In the second stage, we have, uh, we have com conformity. It's characterized with the internalization of the values and norms of the dominant group and a strong desire to assimilate into the dominant culture. Individuals at this phase, what is interesting is that they might have negative attitudes toward both themselves and their group. There is an interesting example here. One, one young Jewish woman said, I tried very hard in high school to not let anyone know I was Jewish. I would talk about Christmas shopping and Christmas parties with my friends, even though my parents didn't allow me to participate at all in the Christmas celebration. Stage three, it's the resistance and separatism. Many kinds of events can trigger this move to the, uh, to the third stage including negative ones such as encountering discrimination or name calling. Uh, a period of so-called dissonance or a growing awareness that not all dominant group values are beneficial to minorities may also precede this stage. Inter, uh, there is a small mistake here. International students sometimes develop their national identity as a minority identity when they study overseas. Stage four, it's the uh, integration. The ideal out outcome of the identity development process is the final stage, which is the achieved identity. Individuals who have reached this stage have a strong sense of their own group identity and an appreciation of other, of other cultural groups. At this stage, they come to realize that racism and other forms of oppression occur, but they try to redirect any anger from the previous stage in more positive way. The end result is individuals with a confident and secure identity characterized by a desire to eliminate all forms of injustice. 
what are the stages of the majority identity development? The first stage, it's the unexamined identity. And this first stage is uh, the same as for minority identities. Uh, individuals are aware of some physical and cultural differences, by, but they do not fear the other or think much about their own identity. Uh, there is no understanding of the social meaning and value of gender, sexual orientation, religion, etc. At the second stage, we have acceptance. It represented the process of internal, internalization, conscious or unconscious, of a racist ideology, ideology. This may involve passive or active acceptance. The key point is that individuals are not aware that they have been programmed to accept this worldview. In the passive acceptance stage, individuals have no conscious identification with being white, straight, male, or other groups. However, they may hold some assumptions based on an acceptance of inequities in the larger society. Stage three, resistance. The next stage represent, represent a shift. It involves a move from blaming minority members for their condition to naming and blaming their, their own dominant group as a source of problems. This resistance may take the form of passive resistance with little behavioral change or active resistance trying to reduce, eliminate, or challenge the institutional hierarchy that oppresses. Then we have stage five. It's the integration. Majority group individuals now are able to internalize their increased conscience and integrate their majority identities into all other facets of their identity. They not only recognize their identity as white, but also appreciate other groups. Uh, this uh, process of integration affects other aspects of social and personal identity, including religion and gender. Um, there are some theories that acknowledge that these kind of models are rather simplistic in explaining uh, the diverse and complex experience that, uh, that people have. Uh, here in this process, it is not taken into consideration that different kinds of influences and impacts of the diverse environment around us and the socialization processes that influence how people experience their dominant identities or the realities of interlocking identities. What is important uh, to conclude at this stage of, uh, of our discussion is that um, uh, it is very important when we talk about the identity issue to take into consideration that it is also important, not only, uh, not only the way how we uh, consider ourselves, how we perceive our habits, our values, our norms, norms, but also how others perceive us in the process. And as, as I mentioned before, the perspectives of others, the time also affects the way we change, we change over time. Uh, then we have uh, some other kinds of cl uh, classifications of the identity and in the, in the general group of social and cultural identity, we have the gender identity. We often begin life with gender, ident uh, with, uh, gender identities. When newborns arrive uh, in our culture, they may be greeted with clothes and blankets in either blue for boys or pink for girls. We all know that. But gender is not the same as biological sex or sexual identity. Uh, it's, a, it, it's a discussion that we, that we all know about. We have the sexual identity. It refers to one's identification with various categories of sexuality. Uh, you're, you're all familiar that um, uh, here we have the heterosexual category, gay or lesbian, and perhaps bis bisexual categories. Uh, however, it, uh, it varies from a culture to culture and have been variously viewed throughout his history. There are lots of theories about, uh, about these issues. Then we have the uh, age identity. Um, as we age, we also play into cultural notions of how individuals our age should act, look or behave. 
this is how we also develop the age identity. We might see, for example, some kinds of clothes, some, uh, some things that we like. We look at uh, the things that are displayed in store windows or advertised in, in the media, but we sometimes, we often have the feeling that we are either too old or too young for, for, that, kind of, for that kind of look. Then we have the racial, racial identity and the ethnic identity and short about these two identities. Race, consci uh, race consciousness or racial identity is largely a modern phenomenon. For example, in the United States today, the issue of race is both controversial and pervasive. It is topic of many, many discussions from television talk shows to talk radios. Uh, but still a phenomenon is observed that many people feel uncomfortable talking about it or think, think about it and that it shouldn't be an issue in, in our daily, uh, daily lives. Um, ethnic identity, in contrast to racial identity, it may be seen as a set of ideas about one's ethnic, members, ethnic group membership. It, it, it includes several dimensions like self-identification, knowledge about the ethnic culture, feelings about belonging to a particular ethnic group, etc. Now, uh, we proceed with, um, with one very important part uh, in the theory of intercultural communication, and it refers to the barriers in the intercultural communication. You've all heard about these main problems that appear in the, inter in the uh, world of the intercultural communication. We have the stereotypes here, beliefs about the characteristics that are considered to be characteristic of a par particular group, that uh, particular groups are the only ones that could do particular things or they feel uh, that way. Prejudice, a negative attitude or affective response to a particul particular group and its members and discrimination, unfair treatment of members of a, group, of, uh, of a group on the basis of belonging to that group. And we all know that there, there are discrimination on, on different grounds. For instance, um, what, uh, what happens maybe in our context in, in this country, what we see through the media, because I, I belong to that world where um, uh, media are often analyzed, and uh, yeah, media uh, often convey uh, pictures, images, uh, or stories that are related, that, uh, that consist some kind of discrimination on, let's say, political grounds or on neg negative grounds. And it's really problematic because it's a phenomenon that is usually uh, then transferred uh, among, uh, among um, citizens. They start to behave in a different way if they are often exposed to this kind of images or stories in, uh, in, in the media. Um, Prejudice is the tendency of individuals to think and feel, feel in negative ways about members of other groups. And discrimination, what's the difference here, is that discrimination is actual, overt individual behavior. They do not always occur together, and they do not always or necessarily have a casual relationship with each other. Uh, prejudice, as well as stereotypes, can be positive or negative. For example, if an individual says, I don't want this and this group to live in my neighborhood, neighborhood that is expressing prejudice. Um, then, uh, we, I think that it's also important to uh, uh, talk about the sources of prejudice. We have the social, uh, the social and the cognitive sources. Uh, social sources, Social sources uh, of prejudice uh, refer to the unequal stages and the social identity, while the cognitive refer to stereotypes and perceived similarities or differences. Social identity. We have a social ca categorization here, division in, in the so-called in-groups, that is us and out-groups, which is them, the others. Our, and our group is favored while we feel some kind of an antagonism with, uh, against, the, against the, the group of the, of the others. Cognitive sources of prejudice. Uh, the prejudice, as explained before, is a consequence of our thinking processes. Um, 
and what happens when we possess uh, stereotypes, which uh, is a generalization of the social groups. It means uh, that we process the information that we get from our surrounding in accordance with the stereotype that we already have. We focus and then something happens following this process. We, uh, from the uh, variety of information that we have around us, we tend to focus to those information that are in compliance with the stereotype. We try to explain the world about, uh, around us, the tendencies that happen, the events that happen around us as a result of the selected information that we, ha we, we, uh, we have at disposal. We, we have a tendency to skip, even, uh, to skip even very important information just to kind of approve the set of information and the stereotypes that we have in, uh, in our heads. Uh, and that's, what, that's why we have this third conclusion saying that we use uh, silent conclusions so that the inconsistent information can appear as consistent. Uh, we all know that there are very complex processes around us, very complex problems, but we tend as people sometimes to simplify these processes as a result of possessing a couple of information and we think that this information are the real ones and we use those information to just build um, a proper conclusion so that we can put some kind of an order in, uh, around us in our, in our thinking uh, processes. Uh, I see that we have only 10 minutes left, so I would go to just, a, j, j, a, j, this is uh, just an in illustration of uh, what I was, uh, what I briefly mentioned about the belonging to in and out groups. Uh, so there is a group uh, organized among, uh, among themselves with certain habits, with certain norms, certain values, and they consider themselves that they are in one group and there is someone on the other side with, who is not the same as them. So when one looks, looks at these groups, may often have a feeling that he or she doesn't belong, belong to that particular group. Uh, so how it is determined what is in and what is out? By creating, simply by creating and maintaining boundaries either physical or symbolic, but there are other explanations as well. As, uh, as I mentioned, we can always find some kind of reason to, uh, uh, to, uh, to try to isolate ourselves from different people ar uh, around us, from the others, and uh, get integrated in smaller groups with others who, whom we perceive that um, uh, accept our values, accept our norms, we have some similarities uh, between us, and uh, this is how isolation in, this, in these groups uh, occurs. Some example here, in groups uh, versus out groups, those from the other religion, those who do not believe in God, and this list can be endless. Uh, uh, if we just uh, shortly think about it, we can always find someone who is different, different than us. What is certain is the fact that every, each and every in-group has its own out-group. Another phenomenon which uh, causes uh, barriers in the intercultural communication is the ethnocentrism. Uh, and the simplest definition about ethnocentrism is the degree to which individuals consider other cultures as inferior in comparison to their own culture. Often, members of the outgroup are perceived as inferior immoral, persistent in their expectations and requests, etc. And this, if there is a high level of ethnocentrism, we all know that it may lead to different, kind of, uh, different kinds of conflicts, even war with an outgroup, as was proven in, in many societies. On the other hand, when a threat from an outgroup is perceived, the members of the in-group gets grow uh, close closer together. They integrate even even more as response to uh, to such a situation. 
what is also specific about this phenomena is that it's not only intellectually comparing yourselves to another culture, but also according to this uh, well-known theorist, scientist Liv Levine and Campbell, it also involves emotions and very strong uh, emotions when the degree of ethnocentrism is, uh, is on, a high, on a high level. There is another phenomenon which causes problems in intercultural communication and it's a considered a big uh, barrier in the intercultural communication. It's the authoritarian personality. This personality thinks in terms of stereotypes and has strong prejudices towards outgroups of all kinds. It's a special complex, special blend of characteristics opinions and values of the person which are common for individuals with an anti-democratic orientation. Uh, the characteristics of this personality may be the following. Humility before authority, authorities or some kind of, of idols. Rigidity in the way of thinking. Uh, then we are prone to stereotypes, conservatism, conventionality, destructiveness, cynicism, etc. So different kind of uh, features of these uh, groups. But there is also something which uh, kind of moves us to the more positive uh, things uh, that are um, uh, in, the, in the intercultural world. It's the multicultural individual. This is a person who in their essential identity is inclined to accept different ways of life and who psychologically and socially accept the diverse reality. It's both, uh, both intellectually and emotionally committed person to the basic unity of human beings while at the same time it, uh, he or she recognizes, accepts and appreciates the difference that exists among people. So to simplify things, this is the person who moves from one to another culture, who has experience belonging to different settings, different cultures, different, uh, different worlds, and thus he or she is able to accept the complexities around us, the differences around us. Uh, this new type of personality cannot be identified according to the language or the languages he or she speaks, the numbers of countries, countries visited, nor a country, uh, according to the size of international contacts he or she has made. It could be identified according to the, wage in the, to the way in which this person perceives the world and accepts the dynamic of living. Thus, we can, we can use one word that explains this kind of, of an individual, and this is flexibility. It's a dynamic person which easily adapts. But also, there is one small issue. Uh, I mean, it's not just a small issue. It's a, it's a, it's a problem which, which can sometimes really affect this kind of an individual. Uh, sometimes they are prone to kind of uh, depression, kind of... Um, a sense that they belong uh, to different worlds, but at the same, ta same time, they do not have uh, their own world because of this feeling that they are split among these different worlds and possessing features, features and characteristics, characteristics, but they have sometimes problem, problem in the consideration of their own identity and in the perception of their own identity. And uh, the last thing that I would like to mention here is the phenomena, maybe you've heard about this phenomena, it's the so-called cultural myopia. In this context, we mention it because in some way it, it describes the feeling of short-sightedness in relation to other culture and focusing only on our own culture. In a way, we are blind to what other cultures do and what is important to them. To them, we are only very str we are strongly focused at what is um, what is important for us and for our culture and for our belonging to uh, to that culture. Reducing cultural myopia is something that is necessary, and it can be done through simple exposure to the influence 
of other cultures and getting to better know them and study them which is uh, which is a uh, this last uh, last sentence says a lot about um, intercultural uh, the, the necessity of possessing uh, uh, intercultural skills to be able to uh, accept differences around us this is actually uh, the uh, the the topic that uh, that we are uh, planning to discuss with our guest uh, visitor today. Before we uh, um, uh, continue the discussion with the uh, with the uh, with the visitor, with the professor Ruben Zeman, I wanted to make a very brief break and ask you uh, ask you if you have uh, if you have any uh, issues, um, if you have uh, a clear understanding of what was briefly uh, briefly uh, described so far about the barriers of inter in the intercultural communication. Maybe some of you can mention some. Uh, let's make the, uh, this communication a two-way communication with you. Maybe some of you would like to mention some problems that are noticed in uh, his or her surroundings, something that is, uh, that is worth um, uh, sharing with the group. I know that all of you can uh, already have experience uh, in a way uh, with this practical exercises that you have uh, with, with, um, with the assignments that you have and you also have the assignment here. Uh, in in the third uh, in the third week, but maybe some of you would like to mention briefly something and share with um, with uh, with the group here. I'm I'm waiting for some for some suggestions or for some questions or for some experience that you could briefly share with us before we proceed with uh, with the second part. Feel free to share your own ideas and your own understandings and perceptions about the barriers in intercultural communication. Have you ever felt some kind of stereotypes? Uh, maybe we can even go to the level to admit that we found ourselves in a situation to have a stereotype for one individual, for uh, for a group, but then when we uh, found ourselves in a situation to um, be closer to uh, that individual or group, we changed our habits and perceptions about um, that particular group, their identity, the way they see things. I see that someone is typing a message, uh, so let's wait for a while and see uh, what will be suggested here. Maybe it's um, it's related uh, with with the stereotypes, with prejudices or discrimination that hap that happens often in this uh, in this world, uh, unfortunately. Uh, but I think that the first thing that we should uh, start with, uh, we cannot maybe change the world around us, but we can change uh, the way we see things, the way by um, by analyzing, first of all, the um, stereotypes that we have, and the way we see things, maybe we can, uh, by starting with this process, we can uh, then proceed with uh, changing our sur surrounding. So I see that several people are typing. In the meantime, our um, guest has arrived. Our our professor uh, Rubin Zeman. I, I've been um, I've been working. Just uh, feel free to proceed writing uh, with your suggestion. I really I really want to hear because. You know, one thing is what we talk about theory. It's another thing what we notice in our daily lives. In our daily lives, we are both exposed to different kinds of stereotypes, and we also recognize our own st stereotypes, as, uh, as I mentioned, something that help, that help us to change over time. Maybe it, it, the change cannot occur overnight, but still, if we are ab aware about this, barriers then we can we can move to the next stage when we can make some changes and we can also since uh, as, as i mentioned before since i kind of belong to the to the media world to the media community in this country uh, working for for a media organization i was a journalist myself i know what happen uh, what happens there out there in in that world how 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 media use different patterns sometimes journalists are um, aware about this sometimes they intentionally 
use these uh, patterns of reporting when uh, w which means stereotyping of people stereotyping of groups but sometimes they do it just simply because they do not have information i wanted to br uh, just uh, mention one very important figure in uh, the world of intercultural communication it's gordon Olbert, who uh, said one very important thing he thinks that um, we can change our stereotypes and our our prejudices is uh, uh, when we get in touch personally with different uh, groups with members of different groups when we become closer to uh, the so-called out groups when we try to understand them when we try to uh, uh, to understand their characteristics their way of thinking their perceptions and then something happens as a result of that some change positive changes happen as a result of that so it uh, uh, journalists often lack information about different groups uh, different ways of thinking uh, either it's it's because there is some kind of closeness uh, of the of uh, the sources of information or it's uh, just because um, there is no uh, curiosity by the journalist to explore more and thus become closer to those groups or maybe uh, because he doesn't use variety of voices in the story variety of voices uh, belonging to different um, ethnic groups different uh, religious groups in the society etc so uh, sometimes problems occur just because we uh, have one-sided view of the things so i'm going to read uh, what violeta said stereotypes discrimination prejudices are very present in the society an example we always judge people by how they look or dress for example nobody would look or help a homeless homeless person who is in pain and lying in the street but if it was a well-dressed person and was fallen on the street most of the passengers would stop and offer help there was an actual tv documentary about this and people were filmed and yes yes and uh, I, I i agree with this really and there was even one theory in social psychology it's the so-called uh, feeling of uh, transferred resp transferred responsibility an experiment was made uh, 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 in um, uh, in new york where uh, a person a person was um, lying on the street uh, like uh, kind uh, the, the per uh, it uh, it was a simulation that the person was wounded and no one stopped to help the person just because everyone was thinking that the other should help it is not me who should help but the other who passed through the street so uh, this uh, very often happens in our daily lives we always think that the others others should solve the problems not us we are not the ones who, sh who should stop by and uh, uh, work on the problem uh, we are waiting for the for the comments for your uh, opinions but i would now i would like to now introduce uh, professor rubin zemun you can you can see him uh, here and um, Good evening. Uh, as i mentioned he uh, he's very experienced in teaching about um, this he is a professor at uh, several universities in the country he has been writing uh, different pieces uh, of research on on this topic and um, previously i made a i made a br brief overview overview about the problems the barriers that happen in the world of intercultural communication like uh, ethnocentrism prejudices stereotypes discrimination on different grounds hate speech that is uh, also used in in various Forms. We also talked about uh, briefly about uh, identity in the intercultural communication, the way the identity is discussed. And um, uh, I also wanted to briefly, uh, maybe you, you wanted to say something at the very beginning, but one of the issues that I wanted to uh, start discussing with you is about your view about the necessity of intercultural communication skills. Uh, why do we need uh, intercultural communication skills and why do we need intercultural education in general? Because uh, it's a kind of a new uh, concept nowadays. Uh, we, when we uh, 
um, we're working on curricula development for intercultural communication and for this kind of courses we realize that it's uh, not so much present in curriculas in schools and universities throughout the world so I would like to um, give the floor to you and maybe if you have something for the beginning but also if we can proceed uh, with the discussion uh, in this way on this issue thank you Marina uh, it, was, it is my pleasure to to be tonight here with you and with our participants on uh, this webinar and uh, of course the issue of intercultural communication interculturalism is very accurate issue not only nowadays in this uh, very how to say tension period especially in the in this region southeast europe and uh, and turkey uh, but generally it, uh, it's a, it's a accurate issue uh, especially after the, the the collapsing of the of the Berlin Wall, let's mm -hmm. say, and then apparently the, the issue of uh, misunderstanding of different uh, groups, different kind of uh, of, of groups, uh, each other. Uh, of course, the the most worst uh, example of misunderstanding it was the the war in ex Yugoslavia, where. Uh, where where we are also coming uh, from, 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 from that context, where also the, it was uh, not uh, acceptable for a lot of people how one very peaceful nation, it, it was uh, the, 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 the nation of ex Yugoslavia, uh, became so um, so savage, <laughs> especially <laughs> on killing uh, each other, especially with uh, maybe friends, and a lot of uh, mixed marriage were destroyed at that time. And, uh, but now today we have this, uh, how to say, I, I came yesterday from one of the international conferences that was in Belgrade, uh, and a lot of my colleagues and scholars uh, saying that now uh, the scholars that are coming from this uh, region, from East Yugoslavia, maybe are one of the best scholars in Europe on <laughs> presenting of multiculturalism and, and researching. When I, I don't want to interrupt you, but when we talk about this, so uh, since you are uh, participating at this kind of gatherings, um, can you uh, identify people in this region that are uh, striving to change the way intercultural communication is perceived? Are there people who are very active in uh, in this field in, of intercultural communication? Yes, uh, because I'm an anthropologist and I'm very often going on the field, and especially the people are very familiar with uh, uh, with the intercultural uh, behaviors, let's say, and attitudes. Uh, people generally in this region are very friendly. They are always accepting people from different uh, groups of different regions and different nation, ethnicity and so on, they wanted to, to communicate. The problem, I think, is uh, with the political elites in, in yes, all these states. Yes, that was my next uh, <laughs> Political elites and, of course, the, the, and of course the, the elites that are also controlling the medias uh, yeah. in, uh, in this region. And uh, well, fortunately, medias uh, in, in this period are one kind of instruments of um, achieving of, of goals of the political elites. Yeah. And the uh, medias, uh, fortunately, in this region, not always are very favored to the interculturalism, intercultural communication, and presenting the diversity. So generally, this region, not only this region, but all the world today is diverse society. And uh, living in a diverse society is not, of course, easy, especially when now we don't have the context of a rural ambient or a rural atmosphere living in a, mm -hmm. in a villages, but now people are living in the most of the population are living in cities or in uh, in metropolis. Of course, for example, Istanbul, you know, only in Istanbul are living 13 million people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and uh, of course, Belgrade, 3 million people and so on. They just, for example, half of the population of Serbia is living in Belgrade. Or I know one quarter of the population of Turkey is living in Istanbul, Ankara yeah. and so on. And we have empty or abundant uh, villages and places generally. And uh, living in now this uh, okay, uh, urban culture, mm -hmm. we have a lot of problems on of uh, understanding or better to say misunderstanding of the people that are coming from different culture, different ground, 
and living in a in the same building. <laughs> and from 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 there is starting the the, and, the, the uh, issue of intercultural communication. Do you think that the isolation from diversity, for example, we live in a village in a small village where we we are in communication with only one culture, yeah. and we've been growing up with one culture only. Do you think that these people are more prone prone to uh, not accepting diversity than the people who are in mixed uh, cultures, in mixed uh, cities, villages, countries? Of course. Uh, uh, for, for one side, we have the nostalgia of, the, of our uh, rural origin. <laughs> the people generally have nostalgia. They wanted to keep the, uh, the tradition, the culture, the, mm -hmm. and so on, because every human being is uh, is a measure of a, of a whole media of a culture. And from other side, the reality now is very different. Uh, and uh, not only uh, coming people from the same nation, but we have in Anthropolis, for example, and people coming from uh, from different uh, parts of the world. <laughs> yeah. And of course, now we have, for example, in, in Belgrade, uh, I mentioned so many times Belgrade in the discussion, but now in Belgrade we have also Chinese community, big Chinese communities in Belgrade, for example. So, and people are still not aware they are, uh, of what is happening in Germany now. So Germany, especially these two or three years ago, have a new reality. It's not anymore the Germany that we know from the 90s. Mm -hmm. Now we have Germany with, uh, let's say, uh, one million uh, refugees from Syria, from Afghanistan, from Africa, and so on. It's a new and land. do you think that is, for example, as a result of this process of uh, influx of uh, refugees, migrants to these countries, Western countries, do you think that uh, as time goes by, something changes in the mindset of, uh, for say, uh, the, the German population of that course. lives there longer? Mm -hmm. uh, or may, because uh, there is a, a worldwide discussion now that there's a, the, a, the, in parallel in some countries there is a strong antagonism of course and division in the society and people become xenophobic and and this is produced by the police uh, the politics the yes, elites yes. media of course but there are some other parallel phenomena maybe we should focus more on what happens to the mindset of the ordinary citizens of the population that lives there do they accept uh, these people who come from other countries and by the way i just wanted to mention feel free uh, colleagues to ask questions to to both of us to discuss your own issues feel free to interrupt us if you have some questions uh, what we have now in germany for example this for, for us anthropologists is very interesting they, for example, if uh, uh, 10 years ago uh, the others of the German society or maybe the, uh, the, the gastarbeiters, as we said, <laughs> uh, or the people that are come, coming from, uh, from Mexico, Slavia, from the Balkans and, and these new uh, countries of the European Union. So uh, for, for only for one night, now they are becoming as a, uh, as a part of the cycle of we, you know, mm -hmm. and the people that knew uh, migrants now, they are the others. Mm -hmm. So there are no any more big boundaries of we, mm -hmm. the, the boundaries are changing. Who are we, who are the others, as you mentioned in previously here. Mm -hmm. So always, uh, you know, uh, who are we and who are the others is uh, an interchangeable uh, line and, and, and boundary. Uh, so, for example, now in Germany, I, I was uh, last year there very often, uh, now we have, for example, uh, uh, three, time of, three types of migrants. So those migrants who came during the 70s with the mm -hmm. Gastarbeiter ga, <laughs> stream <laughs> on 70s to walk in Germany. Uh, now we have uh, migrants that are coming you know, from the Western civilization, for example, Americans, Spanish, I know, Britain, so they, they call them uh, uh, expatries. expatries. Mm -hmm. And migrants that are coming now from uh, Asia and Africa, they are migrants. So we usually always say that uh, uh, not only the the boundaries of uh, we as we as a homeless, you know, as a domestic, not sorry, not homeless, and the others who are coming from abroad, but now we have also racial boundaries, or lines, uh, ethical lines, <laughs> civilization lines, so all the Westerns now are, are, are expatriates. <laughs> Without their coming from France, from Britain, or from the United States, or something, they are all one community expatriates. Yeah. And, uh, and this is also a new reality of the urban living. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah.
And what about the education about intercultural communication? We, uh, for example, in our in our country, uh, we started this. Mm -hmm. We introduced this concept, and uh, it's not at the level of experimenting uh, with this. But do you think that uh, the concept of intercultural education could have a progress uh, and could he, could achieve a progress in soon, soon, uh, not not uh, to wait for a long period mm -hmm. of time to see visible results? Uh, uh, out of this kind of education, one, what is important one to of my accept friends. this? Uh, uh, do you do you uh, listen here to us? Uh, just please uh, confirm, just to be sure that we are uh, that you are listening to our conversation, and we'll proceed. Yeah. Okay. okay. So uh, one of friend of mine is saying that the educa education of uh, of a children is starting 30 years before the the child will be born. <laughs> Does it mean that we have to start education with the parents? Especially for yeah. the for yeah. the intercultural okay. communication. Especially bearing in mind what we discuss uh, in our introduction that uh, our parents maybe are coming from the rural area or from, yeah. the, from the small city. So mm -hmm. we also have to educate them. Because uh, even that we have, we don't have curricula, that's right. But if, even if we have curricula in the school, mm -hmm. again, when the, the, the children are going at home, they will, uh, again, will be the part of their virtual life of the, of the origins coming from the rural area. Mm -hmm. So the education, I think, must be uh, as a holistic, uh, I think, not only for the people, uh, but also education of the of the parents, not of the children. Yeah, yes. one suggestion that we should maybe speak a little bit louder. Okay. okay. Oh, you're okay. Can saying. you can you now hear us? Is it we better be, now? We be maybe close. we should be clo closer yeah, yeah. to the to the uh, laptop. Okay. Much better. Okay. 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 So, sorry. Good suggestion. <laughs> sorry for that. We thought that we have microphones <laughs> in the studio. <laughs> Uh, okay, so uh, feel free if you if you have question questions, we are following uh, following. So this. The, the problem of uh, building uh -huh. curriculums for intercultural communication and multiculturalism is a is a very big issue uh -huh. uh, everywhere in the world uh, because you know when we are talking about. Uh, uh, multiculturalism or diversity, let, let's talk, talk about, and, and we're going to the multiculturalism as uh, ideology and uh, politics, we must be aware of uh, do, two parallel processes. One process is that we have to accept the reality of diversity, and we have to describe the reality. For example, we must know um, all the communities or the differences that are living in our society. Not only to know and to mention them, that, for example, we have Roma, Vlachs, you know, Serbs, and so on, but also we have to know their culture, their history, mm. their identity, their yeah, behavior. Lack of information this. is a huge barrier, I yeah. think. Yeah. For uh, example, maybe some, uh, sometimes there is a kind of, in some societies, some kind of a passive peace mm -hmm. where uh, we do not get in conflict with the other groups uh, or individuals that belong to other groups. But we are not aware about their uh, ways of values. thinking, of their values. cultural values. Their so more active, to the more active approach is needed. And therefore, I'm constantly mentioning the theory of Golden Alport, who says changes can be achieved if we have this personal contact. He, yeah. he has uh, developed this cult uh, theory of personal con contact, and he says that much can be done, a lot of things can be done as a result of having this personal touch with people. With uh, this personal communication, it can help us to, to change the way we perceive things. Uh, and uh, maybe yes, in this yes. context, we can also ask the colleagues if they had uh, experiences when uh, learning about others, being in closer touch with others, maybe help them to change it. I mentioned this question before, but maybe it, it is good if you can really uh, share some experiences. Do you agree with this theory that having a closer uh, communication with the others help us to change over time? And this influences uh, in the way uh, habits are built in the families, in our in our uh, closest surrounding. Mm -hmm. Because one of the preconditions to have a multicultural behavior in cultural communication is the tolerance. So without the tolerance, we can imagine uh, that uh, we, we we are living in intercultural society or interculturalism. Uh, but tolerance is not only just to be aware that the differences are close to us, they are in our neighborhood. 
or, or, the, or the, our neighbors, but we also have to understand their needs, to understand their it's behavior. It's a few steps more, not just yeah. having tolerance, uh, not just being uh, on a distance set That's from right. the others, but also to go on their field. To, and to open dialogue. To open dialogue, Because yes. tolerance is, uh, some scholars say, tolerance is only dialogue open dialogue and dialogue for everything <laughs> and even the ident our identity is developing during the, the dialogue so if we don't have dialogue also for our identity we are not aware why, why we are different from the others there's the theory of otherness uh, and uh, because uh, we, we can know who are we if we don't know who are the others so during the dialogue we can only know who are the others and who are we <laughs> Yes. And if we judge uh, uh, from the way institutions work, let's let's start from this country. We also have bad phenomena in this uh, society as in every other society. So if we judge about these things, seen for, uh, 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 by analyzing how institutions work or behave, how media work, or other other groups like political parties mm -hmm. uh, do we see some problems as a result of that what's the problem which affects intercultural communication the absence of the other or not just the discrimination that we mentioned but uh, sometimes uh, the parties that are forgotten the fact that there is no voice for the other it's a huge problem mm -hmm. it builds uh, problems and barriers in Yes, uh, when we, we, we talk about uh, education. For I think that well, the education must be in a, in many levels and in in, 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 many, in many fields of our society. Not only on the schools, university. We have to to have uh, education also, especially for the politicians, yeah. because people who are making decisions, decision makers, mm -hmm. uh, according to our research, they, they have a very low knowledge about what is diverse society, what is uh, multicultural education, what is intercultural communication. So also the other politicians, in a, especially in intercultural society, must have this kind of education of tolerance and uh, how to, and to, to build politics for um, uh, allowing the tolerance and developing the tolerance of uh, different uh, groups or in, in our society. Yeah. But uh, we also have another issue here, which is the fact that uh, some, uh, in some way these groups, uh, we, uh, their ego doesn't let them take part in this kind of initiatives to learn something new, because they have this uh, thinking uh, that they know everything. Mm -hmm. they, they are, they are uh, not willing to learn something new. So how should we infuse this? How should we change the habits of those that possess the decision-making so, power? What can we do? And I see this also in the mid, in the world of media, uh, also the senior journalists, uh, editors, media owners. They do not want to expose themselves to education to start learning mm -hmm. something, even diversity, inclusiveness in their newsrooms, just because they have this. Uh, uh, perception that they know everything. I will present two examples now, or three examples from the, from the Balkan states. So, uh, uh, when the negotiation started for Croatia to be integrated in the European Union, so the, one of the, uh, you know, every country when they open the negotiation with the European Union, first they open the chapters 23 and 24. Mm -hmm. Chapter 23, 24 is for human rights. Yeah. and uh, especially for minorities in a society. So uh, Croatia, before to open the, the chapter 24, they only mention a few uh, communities of minorities that live in Croatia. So one of the uh, topic or issue that uh, Croatia have to change was that they have to mention all communities or not, no one. <laughs> so they said all. And it is one, how to say, that Croatia accepted a very, how to say, uh, fast and uh, society. It was in one multicultural uh, context there, and uh, it was not a big problem to change the constitution in Croatia. Now we have Albania. Uh, and on 20th of April in Albania, for the first time in the history of Albania, uh, we have the, uh, the, the draft that the government gave to the parliament for the, of the law for potential national minorities in Albania. Mm -hmm. But this fight was more than 25 years, yes. as you mentioned it. Yeah. For example, first in Albania, it was very hard uh, to, to talk with the, with the authorities and, and to convince them that in Albania 
is also a diverse society. It's not a homogeneous nation yes. <laughs> and so on, yeah. but also they have diverse society there. And every intention of, of, of the representatives of the communities was always uh, uh, put it down uh, under the carpet. Yes. Uh, and we had a lot of uh, fights, but for, for example, even that, well, it's a good example in Albania, that even that the government are making uh, this kind of politics of ignorant mm. attitudes to the minorities. From other side, uh, especially those uh, independent uh, and private media in Albania, they always raise the issue of minorities, always. But uh, of course, the, so they are the actor of change. Yes, uh, one uh, contributors, not one actor of change, cannot... contributors, because I think that the pressure of the Council of Europe and the European Union was much more greater. But it was good that uh, we have a good report of the international community, especially the Council of Europe uh, uh, Framework Convention for International Minority and this European Commission Against Racism and Intolerance. Yes. They had a very tough reports for Albania. And always the government wanted to put it on the carpet, but media always show in the public. And they invite experts to discuss what's going on and so on and so on. And finally, the government uh, let in this uh, 12th of April this year, and they, they, they gave, uh, they, they proposed a new law for, uh, the first law, not a new law, the first law for protection national in Albania. This is also good success. So these are two examples. So, uh, of course, uh, 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 states that are coming from uh, Yugoslavia, South of Yugoslavia, where was that concept of uh, brotherhood and unity, brotherhood yeah, and this brotherhood. So people are much more tolerant of the diversity. But the other states, for example, Bulgaria, Albania, Greece, Greece is also a big problem with the recognized diversity. Turkey, uh, Romania, and so on. They, they, they had a lot of problems because they are built on the on the concept of nation state, of homogeneous, how to say, or melting pot system of yes. homogeneous uh, nation. And it was very uh, hard and tough to first to to convince and to the, the people to understand that their country is not so homogeneous, that they in their country are living a lot of mm. diverse uh, communities and groups. The theory about the salad, that each yeah, and yeah. every ingredient is uh, yes, so the salad special. Is or maybe salad uh, did you hear did you hear about this theory about the melting pot versus the salad uh, theory, bowl. salad bowl theory? Yeah, probably. <laughs> so melting yeah. pot, uh, melting pot is a theory that uh, uh, in, in what pot uh, uh, we have to put all, all diversities and and they become one. They become like, like like France, like Americans, for example. It was uh, before 60s. So everybody will put in one uh, pot and we will uh, meld them. <laughs> and they lose their, uh, their, their identity. identity, their characteristics. That's right. They are similar. They are all uh, similar. Then after, yeah. they are identical. While the salad bowl theory uh, means that uh, you have the salad, you have the different ingredients, you know. different kinds of vegetables, and they have their own they features. Are cropped. <laughs> <laughs> they are cropped, but the, but still they keep their uh, uh, characteristics integrity. and integrity because each of the ingredient uh, ingredients gives a special taste to the salad. So it is recognized that each ingredient has a special uh, contribution that's in right. a way. That's so right. that's, that's the right. salad, uh, salad bowl theory. That's right. Uh, so, so uh, of course, the, the, when we want to make a, uh, uh, how to say, uh, co cohesion in our society, we, we always have to, to think about salad bowl for one of the uh, famous scholar uh, for multiculturalism, well, for this assimilism of or, uh, people who affirm the melting pot system, they say that they, they wanted to make people as a water, no color, no taste, <laughs> no, no nothing. But unfortunately, when they start to drink that water, it became vodka or rakia. <laughs> Yeah. And also, uh, when when talking about this uh, theory about the salad bowl theory, yeah. uh, there, there were some opponents to this theory saying, but how can you produce one thing, one product, with having so diversities at one place? Mm -hmm. uh, but then uh, there was another theorist who said, you always have a connector, you always uh, mm -hmm. have someone which connects things. Like in this case, it's the dressing of the salad. 
It's the you put this um, spices, cream, cream. <laughs> the cream, the connector, and it becomes one product. Mm -hmm. So when illustrating things in uh, this way, you see uh, they all uh, all the ingredients stay as such. They contribute to the taste, uh, but uh, there is one connector which unites them all. And in, in, so in, you, in, when in we states, go to the real world, yeah. uh, it's a it, law. It's a legislation actually. That, that is connected, but the legislation has to be much more uh, tolerant to the diversities. If the, our legislation is not tolerant, and constitution, of course, is not tolerant, then we have a melting pot yeah. system. <laughs> Since we are coming to the end of okay. this discussion, and uh, well, we are still waiting for your suggestions and questions. If you have some, maybe we can conclude this part of our organization of our uh, discussion uh, by just talking about what we see as a key for improvement of intercultural communication. What is needed? Let's start. Let's uh, talk about uh, what is possible to be done tomorrow in a couple of days from now, in a couple of weeks mm -hmm. or a couple of months. What is possible to be done? Uh, let's uh, talk about our country and I guess uh, our colleagues, the students from different countries would recognize this as a model that is possible or maybe they have some other suggestions for their own country. So yeah. what should be done in, in an immediate uh, way to just make the things more positive, uh, uh, bring them on a higher level? Of course, we as a scholars, when we are talking about future, we always must uh, think for, uh, for three possibilities. It's a pessimist variant, optimist and realistic. <laughs> <laughs> so pessimist variant is that uh, maybe... Uh, I don't know, uh, following the, what is going on, in, uh, in, especially this last one year, uh, with Brexit and with, uh, you know, with, uh, with politics now of, of American President Trump, or what is now going on in, in Turkey, which is also uncertain, what will going on in Turkey, and so on. Uh, the pessimists said that the, the, the people will, um, or the elites, uh, especially right wing, uh, ring, uh, right uh, wing, uh, mm -hmm. uh, yes, right uh, wing, sorry. right wing, sorry, <laughs> right wing uh, elites uh, maybe <coughs> will control the world in next, I don't know, five or ten years, and mm -hmm. uh, then we'll maybe we will uh, spoke less about diversity and understanding of mutual understanding. You think it's possible in that <laughs> pessimist view? That uh, diversity might vanish, might disappear as a. Not disappear, but we will put in a low, it low level neglected, of, of, of agenda. Of agenda, mm -hmm. yeah. Then uh, optimistic is that, uh, however, people are much more build build the citizen uh, identity. So we, maybe we forgot to discuss about every person ha ha has a uh, lot of identities in the same moment. So uh, at this moment, the national identity is very strong everywhere, especially in Europe in the world. You know? mm -hmm. But maybe citizen identity uh, that we, uh, or political identity, it's, uh, it's not on a, on a priority. Maybe we have uh, to think much more of a citizen and political identity of each related uh, without uh, uh, considering the, what kind of ethnic or religious identity I have. We all live in one city and we are all living in one state and we have to build our future for all of us to be better and for our children and so on. So we have to build our political to have better laws, to have better you know, technical mm -hmm. uh, achievements and uh, to, to live uh, in a uh, um, in good uh, economic uh, situation or welfare and so on. Uh, that's it, how to say, political identity. But if you're still thinking about national ethnic identity, and then we have regard uh, the de degraded process, processes. So uh, people probably, uh, I think, uh, even the elites will thinking about uh, uh, their interests. People generally in these democratic societies are much more thinking for citizen identity. And uh, that's it uh, for me, maybe the, the, the reality of what we're going on. So uh, we, we have to continue slowly, but surely, step by step, to build uh, tolerance and uh, to build uh, and to find uh, uh, measures and politics how to all of us together to, to, to have a collective uh, improvement. Mm -hmm. Not only one group to, 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 to be uh, in good. Uh, position and the others to be in bad position, worse position. So that's it not, uh, I think, when people started to think, uh, I think uh, now we have that uh, consciousness that uh, everybody in society, especially in our city or in our state, have to have 
uh, one one step forward to go in collectively, not only one group. Yes, and, and education, of course, the education system plays a very important role. And mm. education, as you mentioned before, is needed in all segments, in at all at uh, all ages, uh, in primary, secondary uh, schools. Politicians, so, so it parents. should be <laughs> politicians, parents. It should be it should be integrated everywhere, not mm. just as an experiment, not not just as a short time uh, thing idea. But in this context, the, the media, I think, have a uh, the, the the main role, especially with production of documentaries of, of stories of good uh, examples, best cases. Providing the different uh, perspectives. Uh, and, uh, uh, I mentioned it. this before uh, you came here, that uh, many times the problems happen just because there is one-sided uh, way of presenting <laughs> things. And uh, if you talk about different minorities or different groups, you, you, you do it, if you're some rigid journalist, you do it just uh, to mention, just to be fair. Mm -hmm. But that's not the active approach which is uh, required. Uh, it is required to present them actively, to present uh, different people belonging to different identities as sources of information, right. as experts which can who can talk about different issues, not just to say I have uh, one uh, one Turkish, uh, one, one Muslim, one, one Christian. One Muslim. <laughs> so it's it's not a formula thing. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's something that should become a natural way of uh, presenting things, regardless if it's media or it's uh, universities mm -hmm. or institutions, because we have this issue everywhere, not just yes. uh, not just yes. in yes. the media. Yes. So I would finalize this uh, part okay. of our discussion. Um, if there is any question, feel free to do it uh, now before we close out this uh, uh, day. I know it's Friday, we are all tired and we all <laughs> wait for the weekend to happen. After you start. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, we won't keep you longer. Um, did you did you like the discussion that we had today? Maybe something was unclear. Feel free to tell us. To know about it. If you have no suggestion or no question, then we are just going to. Okay, if they are interested, much more for deeper, so uh, uh, they can uh, contact us on uh, Facebook, especially yes, very active yes. on Facebook. Or so a, Professor or Ruben Zemon <laughs> also has uh, his own Facebook profile. Uh, Feel free to add yeah. him as a friend. Uh, and and uh, of course, we may. Yeah. We'll, we may have always, uh, I'm always open, not only for but also as an angel activist for, for this issue, and uh, we are always helping people to overcome some some issues. Okay, Thank so you. we hear I, 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 you I, enjoyed the discussion. Yeah, so it's for, for Turkey, so I will be in uh, Ushak University on a uh, 5th of May, I will have one lecture there. Oh, so, really? okay. <laughs> so if they are close to Ushak, they can come. They also. can come and visit the lecture. <laughs> yes. Okay. Okay, so have a nice weekend. Um, and uh, we'll stay in touch. You have the description of the assignment. You have the materials uploaded. Uh, feel free to suggest uh, something if needed addition, in addition to this. Uh, webinar and we'll stay in touch if something is unclear then um, uh, thank you thank you for that um, we'll we'll explain things in more details uh, my colleagues uh, uh, who worked with you in the previous weeks told me that they've got really good assignments made by you so i'm also stimulating you to continue working in this uh, productive way uh, produce some good assignments. It is very helpful for us. We'll get, uh, uh, as professors uh, working with you, we'll get new insight and it's very mean meaningful to, to us uh, as professors. Thank you and have a nice weekend. Thank you. Thank you, Professor.